Now at 11, Oregon's positive corona test rates rise in a sign the virus is spreading. Plus, a debate over Portland's protests in Washington, D.C. The feds blame violent protesters for the chaos, but Oregon lawmakers say the Trump administration made it all worse. And the Blazers pull off a crucial win against a top team to keep their playoff hopes alive. This is KGW News at 11. And we begin tonight with two protest scenes in Portland. This is a look at the group gathered near the Justice Center in downtown. It's a much smaller scene than we've seen this time last week. They listen to speakers talking about their experience with racism in Portland. At the same time, another group is gathered in North Portland near the Portland Police Association headquarters. They're again calling for police to be defunded. Police have been warning the crowd here to stop trying to break into the building. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Brittany Falkers in for Laurel. Now we've heard from several protesters injured by police during these events, but federal officials now say their agents have had hundreds of injuries while responding to the protests. That was part of a testimony in D.C. today on Portland protests, freedom of speech and violence. Catherine Cook reports. This is happening in my home state in Austin and in Dallas. In Washington, D.C. Tuesday. And it's happening across the country. Lawmakers held Winter a hearing Indiana, called Nevada. Protecting Free Speech and Preventing Violent Protests. Nowhere more so than in Portland, Oregon. At the center of it, Portland and protests in front of the federal courthouse downtown. Violent extremists in Portland have perverted the peaceful protests in the aftermath of George Floyd's tragic death. That's Ken Cuccinelli, acting deputy secretary of Homeland Security. He called the protests in Portland unprecedented. DHS did not have to expand its presence in Portland because of peaceful protesters. And that's why I'm sitting before you today. Cuccinelli says around 140 federal agents tasked with protecting the federal courthouse sustained at least 277 injuries. Of those, he said 113 were eye injuries from lasers. Now, if I hold my hand in front of that laser, it's hot by that point in time. There's a video that should display this now. Video from weeks of demonstrations shows protesters shining lasers into officers' eyes from short range. Contrary to remarks by the White House press secretary, Cuccinelli says no officers were left permanently blinded. We've had a number of, of officers who had uh, days-long blindness. So far, they've all kind of come back, if you will. Cuccinelli says the remaining 164 injuries sustained by officers were related to hearing, followed by contact with objects. People who are uh, using every form of weapon, this is a, this is a water bottle, frozen and they're getting thrown at our officers, the simplest thing in the world. And um, pipes, fireworks, chemicals, Molotov cocktails. Violent conflict in Portland was down before Donald Trump got involved. Portlanders are standing up for justice. During his I've testimony, Senator Ron Wyden focused on constitutional rights. He asked who Americans believed was a greater threat to them, federal agents or protesters. Is it the Oregonians who gathered in my hometown in overwhelmingly peaceful protests for racial justice since the murder of George Floyd? Or is it the heavily armed secret police who snatched who Portlanders you? off the streets in the unmarked vans and interrogated them without justification or charges? Catherine Cook, KGW News. I knew not everyone was going to agree with me, but I didn't think they were going to go out of their way to write a full letter and explain to me all of the reasons I should take it down. New at 11, we're hearing from a Lake Oswego teen who's being pressured by some of her neighbors to take down a sign at her home that supports the Black Lives Matter movement. This story had Lake Oswego trending nationally on Twitter. And as Mike Benner reports, the teen at the center of this has no plans to back down. Silence supports police violence. That's the message in the window of a Lake Oswego home. 15-year-old Nandita tells KGW she painted the sign in the days following George Floyd's death. I felt like this was just something that I could do with my time that would take my mind off like the frustration and anger and kind of make me calm down a little bit. <laughs> so... Yeah. Don't be mistaken. 
That's a nervous laugh, because there's nothing funny about what just happened to Nandita. She received a letter from anonymous neighbors saying they appreciate the strong political and social justice viewpoint. But there are three homes for sale on the street, and the sign is driving down interest to live on this street. The letter, littered with spelling and grammatical errors, as you're about to see, goes on to say, Homes are not made to be billboards for our opinions. They are a place for families to rest, enjoy life, and feel safe. Nandita is then urged to take down her visible show of support for the Black Lives Matter movement. I didn't really think that everyone was going to side with me, but I was very shocked by how, like, open it was. Like, we are, like, valuing our property over this statement that everyone should agree with. Um, That was my feeling. I was like, wow. Just as shocked was Nandita's older sister, who posted the neighbor's note on Twitter. The tweet has gotten more than 11,000 retweets and 42,000 likes, not to mention thousands of comments. I've gotten a lot of positive messages. The ones that hurt the most are the ones that say, this exact thing has happened to me so many times. That hurt the most. The executive director of the Coalition of Communities of Color told R. Maggie Vespa what happened to Nandita is not an isolated case. I've seen other, I'd heard reports from friends of mine and colleagues who had gotten letters or in their neighborhood or next door listings with their anonymous, cowardly protests about uh, people's signage. In- How many stories like that have you heard? At least three or four. In response to the letter sent to Nandita, Lake Oswego City Manager Martha Bennett released a statement. In part, it reads, We stand in solidarity with this family. No one should have to live with suspicion and fear of one's neighbors. Uh, Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Yeah. Nandita tells us she's been encouraged by family and friends to keep the sign up and not give in to those neighbors. And they were just like, no, this is absolutely insane. You did absolutely nothing wrong. It's your property. It's your First Amendment right. And they shouldn't be telling you what to do. All right, Nandita tells us not all of her neighbors have a problem with the sign. She says some have come to her house to show their support. Others have sent letters themselves, even flowers. I'm Mike Benner for KGW News. In the pandemic, Oregon reported 342 new coronavirus cases today, along with five more deaths. The state is now closing in on 20,000 total cases. This chart tracks the daily numbers. The cases now include at least 25 campers and staff members at Trout Creek Bible Camp near Corbett. It shut down last month after the first staff member tested positive. Last week's tests also found more than 6% of people were infected. It's a number that matters because it's gone up even as testing numbers went up, so the virus is spreading. Experts estimate it's infecting between 1,000 and 1,600 new people each day. What do you think of those numbers? The numbers are very, very concerning. Um, My focus uh, on uh, COVID-19 is to make sure that Oregonians stay safe and healthy. And that's why we've worked really hard to implement restrictive measures across the state that will prevent the spread of the virus. In Oregon, the virus has infected young adults 20 to 29 more than any other age category. But that might also be why serious cases of the virus have remained relatively low. This is a look at the number of new people with COVID admitted to the hospital in Oregon each day. It's never been more than 35. And after a spike in early July, the numbers are trending back downward. Well, Portland Public Schools is putting together a new program to help families with child care for the upcoming year. It's a daycare for PPS students ages 5 to 12 and children of PPS employees who would be learning remotely otherwise. It would go from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Kids will do schoolwork and have other activities. But this plan isn't final yet. PPS wants to hear from parents first. And I think for me, I felt like it was just a little early. They don't have all the answers yet and it's still coming together, but I know that San Francisco is doing something similar and I was excited to see that the conversations were starting and I'm hopeful, like other cities, they're gonna have an actual plan come to life that's gonna support families. The program would cost $1,000 a month, but some families may qualify for financial aid. PPS says it will follow all coronavirus safety guidelines. If it happens, spots will be very limited. 
A large stash of ammonium nitrate is being blamed for a massive explosion in Beirut that killed at least 100 people and injured thousands. Officials in Lebanon say the material had been stored in a warehouse since it was confiscated from a cargo ship back in 2014. Video appears to show a fire nearby just before the explosion. Local TV reports a fireworks warehouse was involved. It's believed the fire then spread to a nearby building, triggering the explosion and generating a shockwave. Tomorrow will be a national day of mourning in Lebanon for the victims. It is primary day in Washington with several top ticket races, including for governor. Early results show incumbent Governor Jay Inslee stocking out a lead. Now, he is running for his third term and has captured 52 percent of the vote so far. Lauren Culp, who is the police chief of Republic Washington, leads the field of Republican challengers with 17 percent. Also in the third congressional district race, incumbent Republican Jamie Herrera Butler will face Democrat and Washington State University Vancouver faculty member Carolyn Long. It's a rematch of their 2018 battle. The district covers Vancouver and Southwest Washington. And you can find a recap of the other big races in the state right now on KGW.com or your KGW app.